The RTX 5080 is a great GPU in a vacuum. In every game I tested it delivered good FPS in 4K and astonishing FPS in 1440p. Especially here the 5080 provides a pleasant sense of confidence knowing you can launch any game without worrying about settings. You just set it and it works. And it works so well that not every CPU can handle the load. That was the case for me even though I built a system with a Ryzen 9700X. Overclocked 9700X. For example, I could just throw away my results from Spider-Man Remastered. The 8-core chip rarely kept up with the GPU, even in 4K, especially with RT enabled. I even deliberately reduced the load by lowering the number of NPCs on the map. Not enough. 110 FPS and that's not even the final result. But The RTX 5080 doesn't exist in a vacuum, there are other GPUs around. And in other games the CPU was just about sufficient, that means we can properly assess what we are dealing with. And here things aren't as rosy. As much as possible considering your GPU delivers over 100 FPS in The Last of Us. That's a lot! Older and weaker models simply can't achieve this for two main reasons. First, max quality textures take up too much memory and something like the 3080 already starts struggling with its 10 gigs of VRAM. You're experiencing unpleasant hiccups, slowdowns, and to get rid of them you need to lower some memory intensive settings. And the second reason, the 5080 is just plain more powerful. Compared to it, the 3080 still holds up decently, but its age is starting to show, especially in 4K. The difference is almost two times. Memory plays a significant role here. The RTX 5080 features 16 gigs of very, very fast chips. So fast that it comes close to the 4090 with a much wider memory bus. With just a slight overclock you can easily push a terabyte per second on VRAM. History has seen cases where even that wasn't enough to save a GPU, but usually fast memory helps minimize FPS drops when playing at higher resolutions, like 1440p or 4K. As we've already seen in The Last of Us and as we'll see in upcoming tests, the GPU handles high resolution with confidence. Four years after release you can now launch Cyberpunk and almost forget about tweaking the settings. In 4K there are still a few rough spots where FPS takes a hit, but 1440p is fully accessible at any graphic settings, even with past tracing enabled, at native resolution. I can hardly imagine someone buying a thousand dollar MSRP GPU and much more thousands of dollars right after release just to play at 37 FPS with dips below 30. But technically you no longer have to enable DLSS for past tracing. Though you can enable it. 170 FPS with past tracing, an interesting experience despite any caveats. With the previous generation Nvidia GPUs learned to add an artificial frame between two real ones to boost FPS and improve perceived smoothness. A controversial feature as it often created more problems than frames, especially on the 4060. Guess how I know. In this generation instead of just one, multiple artificial frames are inserted between real ones. And at least in Cyberpunk their quality has improved. If your base FPS, the one before frame generation, is at least 50, artifacts are rare. I'd say about half as many as I was used to. Input lag remains mostly unchanged, while the displayed FPS increased so much that what used to be a useless feature now sometimes makes sense. Especially if other developers implemented with the same level of quality as Cyberpunk. It has become an interesting option that you can enable under certain conditions, but it's by no means a magic pill that solves all problems. It's great to see 170 FPS generated from 50 when you already had a decent experience. But what about scenarios when the GPU is struggling and you're trying to achieve something usable like in this Nvidia slide? Nah. First, the slide relies heavily on the DLSS upscaling set to performance. It will help to boost the base FPS to begin with. Second, at low base FPS, like 35, the AI lacks enough information to generate a stable image. This leads to so many noticeable artifacts that your eyes constantly catch them. Every second something glitches somewhere. And at this point it's better to just lower the settings, cause such a messy trade-off for smoothness isn't worth it.
And the worst part, the more frames the AI generates, the lower your base FPS, making the problem even worse. That's why frame generation should only be used when your GPU is already handling the game well and you just want to fill your monitor's refresh rate. And that's the only useful scenario. Because frame generation is a trick, treated as a trick that can make the gameplay feel smoother. Feel smoother. And nothing more. You won't get all the benefits of real frames, so comparing artificially generated to 40 FPS to traditional to 40 FPS is misleading at best. In fact, the more artificial frames you have, the higher the chance to notice artifacts. That's why you're given a choice between X2, X3 and X4 frame generation to balance smoothness and image quality. Or you can just skip the feature entirely. Because without any tricks, Stalker runs exceptionally well. During a 5 minute test run across the garbage area, the gameplay remains smooth the entire time. At native 1440p, the game once again pushed so many frames that the CPU barely kept up. If the new card were even slightly more powerful, we'd start seeing minor underutilization, just like with the 4090, where a few percent of its power was already left unused. And with DLSS on quality, the bottleneck shifts entirely to the CPU, so to see true capabilities of these GPUs, you have to enable 4K. Wow. Stalker is one of few games in this test where the 5080 comes this close to the 4090. Usually the gap is wider. The RTX 5000 series is the first to use PCI Express 5. The difference from PCI Express 4 – minimal, just 1-3% in most cases – that's great news, because all my tests were effectively done on PCI Express 4 because of this SSD installed in the wrong place that cut the available lanes in half. Well, not a big deal. I guess the most interesting part of the video. Keep in mind that numbers on the left are already 2 years old, that's when I last tested the 4080, and if I redid those tests today, some things would definitely change. But the overall picture is clear. Almost everything I've praised about the 5080 also applies to the 4080, with a few caveats. And as luck would have it, the 5080 shines particularly well in these tests. If I could compare them across a larger set of newer games, the differences would shrink. On average, I'd expect around 10... 15% performance gap between them, so if we ignore multi-frame generation, the 5080 doesn't really introduce anything groundbreaking. It doesn't shake the status quo, and the bad value of 4080 smoothly transitions to just mediocre value on the new one. These GPUs are so similar in standard gaming that I completely understand why some people might see the 5080 as Nvidia's third attempt at selling the same card. They just indexed performance slightly to account for two-year gap between the releases. So today's 5080 feels like the 4080 did back then. For a clearer perspective, you just call it the RTX 4080 Super Pooper AI Plus, and you'd have the right expectations. Not impressive. A 15% performance increase and the same amount of VRAM, that's not what you expect after two truly strong generations. Both the 3080 and 4080 significantly raised the bar in terms of raw muscle. And let's not forget, just a year ago we've seen a similar percentage gains from a simple refresh of a lineup. But this… this is supposed to be a whole new generation. The connection to the 4080 also drags down the impression. It has the reputation of movie theater medium-sized popcorn, the one that only exists only to push you towards buying big bucket. Just replace popcorn with 4080 and 4090. The, for the 4080 was never meant to stand on its own. It was a placeholder with a deliberately terrible price, designed to make the 4090's price seem less absurd in comparison. And two years later, 16 gigs of VRAM is still 16 gigs of VRAM. In Cyberpunk, I even managed to nearly max it out. That's a big picture view. But coming back down to earth, I wish I owned a placeholder like this. In some games, my RTX 4060 in 1080p with DLSS barely pushed out more FPS than this thing does in 4K native. Aside from frame generation, Nvidia also updated display outputs 
and added a few niche improvements. Things like FP4 support for AI, 422 video encoder decoder, they slightly lowered VRAM usage for frame generation and added support for neural shaders. Will you feel the impact of those shaders? Maybe in the future. Neural shaders are also supposed to reduce VRAM usage, so in theory the gap between the RTX 40 and 50 series should become a bit more noticeable over time. And as frustrating as it is that VRAM capacity hasn't increased, 16 gigs is still enough. For now. Only a few games are starting to come close to that limit, I'd say we have about 3 more years before most major titles consistently hit 14-15 gigs on maximum settings. Then we'll start running into some issues. Look at the 3080, it only started struggling recently and how old is that now? Even then, stutters aren't permanent, they can be fixed by lowering some settings. But honestly, spending that much money on new GPU and thinking, eh, should last me about 3 years, that's wrong. Power consumption remained one of Nvidia's strong points. In most cases I saw 220 to 70 watts with some games in 4K pushing 300. These are reasonable numbers, I actually expected around 50 watts more on average. Given its high MSRP, the card is guaranteed to come with a massive cooler, probably big enough to handle a 5090, so fan noise isn't an issue. But coil wine is another story. My MSI sample under load got high pitched noise, not too loud but noticeable. It blended in with the hum of the fridge in the kitchen. The RTX 5080 is a great GPU, once again at a bad price, and first in a line for a batch with the word super on it as soon as AMD brings any more competition with its next generation cards. Cause even now the 7900 XTX looks like a solid alternative, at least because you can actually buy one. It's a shame I couldn't get a sample for comparison. Any decent AMD release will force Nvidia to react and do something with 5080. Think about it, it's only 2 weeks old and it's already clear that an update is inevitable. So if you're thinking about buying one right after launch, First, good luck finding it at recommended price, but second, you'll probably be impressed. Based on my benchmarks it performs great in games, but I can't shake the feeling that waiting a few months might get you a better deal. At very least the initial shortage should clean up and stabilize the price. Or maybe something even better might hit the market, we'll see. It all depends on AMD. Thank you for your support, likes and subscribes. My name is Roman, see you in the next video.